to come up to me last summer, and uh, just as kids can do so often, I, I just I love how they just get right to the point. You know, sometimes as adults, we try to get to a point, but we take like the long route to get there, and by the time we get there, we kind of forget what it was we were asking. Well, a child come up to me the first Sunday in July and say, uh, hey, uh, Joel, uh, what's the deal? And I'm like, what are we talking about? He goes, where, where are the cookies at? Where are the cookies at? And I was like, oof. I'm not going to be able to get it. So I guess we, we kind of have a tradition here that when we're on the lawn, we don't have cookies. And when we're not on the lawn, we kind of do. And I said, I, I, I don't know. And he's kind of looked at me and says, well, you're going to sort this out soon, I hope, right? So <laughs> needless to say, we'll have cookies in July. So uh, we'll go from there. But I also realized that, that maybe I should have asked this question before the majority of the kids and the youth left. But I think there's still a few here. I don't want to date myself, but, but for those of you that are still in school, you know, how many of you still have pop quizzes or surprise tests? Is that, is that something that, that happens anymore? No, they've gotten rid of it? Really? I mean, well, back in the day, I love, I, I think I'm old enough, I'm 37, can I say that now? Back in the day, I hated, hated pop quizzes. There was this, like, sense of just, not feeling great when I'd walk into class and you'd sit down and the teacher would walk in the room and say, okay, class, put your books away. We're having a surprise test. And they always said it with that tone of voice, like this was going to be a good thing for anyone. And I thought, oh, crap, this is not going to be good. And, and my, my, my palms would get sweaty. And because it's one thing if the teacher tells me that a test is coming, Right? Because then I can you know, prepare and try to cram as much information into my head as I can and then hopefully just get it out on the paper. But, but a pop quiz, a surprise test, essentially says, okay, here we go. Let's see where you're at right now with what you know. And so it can oftentimes catch you off guard. Well, the past number of months, if you're just joining us, don't worry, there's no pop quiz here today. We're not, we're not going to do that. But But what we have been doing is we've been focusing on the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is a book that really looks upon what does it look like to be wise? What does it look like to live all of life with God? And essentially what Proverbs is are individuals looking back upon life and making observations that they have noticed in their life and in the lives of others as to what begins to happen when you live all of life with your focus being upon God. And on the opposite side of that, a fool, according to what the scriptures say, is someone who who lives life in a way that they don't really acknowledge God's presence, that they just kind of go through life without recognizing that God is at work in the midst of all things. And so what we've done kind of week to week is began asking that question of, okay, what does this really look like for me? in terms of the various situations and the various scenarios that we find ourselves in, what does it look like to live all of life with God? And that's why kind of our foundational verse has been Proverbs 3, 6, that says, in all your ways, acknowledge God. In absolutely everything that you do, whether big or whether small, acknowledge Him. But I know for many of us, so often we, we kind of like tests a little bit, don't we? especially if you know you're going to do well. Because you want to kind of have a, a measure and say, okay, how, how am I doing? How, how are things going? And sometimes the way in which our minds work, or mind does anyways, is we kind of want to take a step back and say, okay, wait a second. You know, Proverbs 3, 6 is a great verse. You know, in, in all my ways acknowledge him, but, but how am I doing? How am I doing when it comes to walking day by day with Jesus? Is there some sort of test? Is there, is there some sort of measure that, that we can use in the midst of life? Are there, any, are there any jewelers here this morning? No? Good, okay. So I can speak somewhat intelligently about this and no one will know. Um, metals are tested by I- exposing them to extreme high temperatures in order to remove any impurities. So if you take silver or if you take gold and and, and you heat them up, you can see how pure the metal actually is because the impurities melt away. And so when we think of there's that type of test, we suddenly land in the book of Proverbs and God uses that as an example to say, okay, here we go. 
there are ways that we can test our faith. There, there are ways, scenarios and situations that come along in life to see if God is really as important as we may or may not say that he is. And we read this in Proverbs 17, 3. It says, The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. And so there we have it. We kind of have it laid out before us. Think, okay, that, that's helpful. We, we, we know that there are ways in which we can begin to kind of measure, you know, how we are walking with God. But the question is, well, what is it? What, what type of a test does God often use as an opportunity for us to see, you know, is he as important as we want him to be? So as I began thinking about this, I, I started to realize, well, one of the primary themes of the Bible is that God wants to be in a relationship with us. That God wants us to be the, the most important relationship in our life. And as I began to think of, well, well, how do you test the depth of any other relationship? And then how do we begin to apply that to our relationship with God? I found myself going back to my marriage vows. And I'm sure many of you, if you're married, you know, you, you have made similar vows to, to your spouse. And you begin to realize that, that these are not just simply words we speak, but, but this is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of not only marriage, but in terms of any relationship. I don't know about you, but I, I made promises to, to Rebecca to, to remain faithful, though, though richer or poor. In sickness and in health, in, in good times, and in bad. And what you begin to realize is that you see the spectrum and the test of, 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 of any relationship is really how do you respond in times of prosperity, and how do you respond in times of adversity? I'm sure we've perhaps found ourselves in those situations in life that when suddenly things have begun to go wrong, when, when things have suddenly begun to become hard, whether it is with your children or, or whether it's with your spouse or whether it's with your parents or, or whether it's with other friends or, or colleagues, you know that when suddenly things begin to go difficulty, become difficult, that is the place where you say, okay, wait a second here. Am I going to stick with this? Am I going to continue to persevere in spite of the difficult circumstances that I find myself in? In the same way, sometimes a more subtle test is the one of prosperity. You know, when suddenly things begin to go exceedingly well, how do you handle it? How does that begin to, to change, if at all, the dynamics of your relationship? Have, have you ever heard the saying of, you know, you know money or success? That, that really changed them. And you start to think, well, well, if these are measures that we use in terms of every day-to-day -day relationships, are these the same type of tests, the same type of measures that we can then begin to reflect upon our relationship with God? You see, I think sometimes we've got it reversed. Sometimes people believe that the circumstances we face in life, whether good or bad, are, our, are a reflection of God's love for us. We may not notice it initially, but we oftentimes use this language that, that when things are going well in life, we, we suddenly have this, this understanding or this belief that, that God's favor is being poured out on us. And that if something is now suddenly going wrong or, or not according to plan, that, 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 that maybe God has withdrawn his love from us. But that simply can't be the case because we read over and over and over again that God's love is, is unconditional. And for me, in the simplest form, it means that there's not conditions placed upon his love. So, so therefore, the conditions of life, whether good or bad, adversity, prosperity, are not actual indicators of God's favor towards us. But in the other way around, they can become indicators of how we truly view God. You see, so often these opportunities arise in the midst of life. 
kind of like surprise tests, pop quizzes that come completely out of the blue, totally unexpected, that often come across as being either times of prosperity or adversity. And it's an opportunity for us to evaluate. Does God truly play the role in our life that we say that he does? Or that maybe even we hope that he would. So that's really what we're going to kind of unpack here this morning, is is how do we look at these two tests of life as a measure of seeing how valuable is God to me? The first one is prosperity, and, and I would say that is probably the more subtle of the two. It can often kind of creep up on us and, and get us to a place where, where we may not even understand how we have gotten there. Proverbs 11.28 says this, A life devoted to things is a dead life. A stump. You never read Proverbs and think, you know what, tell me what you really think about these subjects, right? A life devoted to things is a dead life, a stump. A God-shaped life is a flourishing life tree. You know, when we think of prosperity, when when we think of success, it can be in the realm of relationships. It can be in the realm of of finances and material stuff. It can be in the realm of of, of the workplace or or accomplishments or or fame or in terms of praise. I mean, there's so many things that can can bring good things into our life, and we say, well, wait a second here. How how is this a test? Like, Like, true or false? Does God want us to be successful, true or false? True. I I, I think God wants us to be successful. He's given us gifts for a reason, not to be mediocre, but to thrive. You know, does God delight when we enjoy and appreciate the good things in life? Yeah, I I, I think so. Absolutely. So, so, so what is the issue that's, that's going on? And this is the subtlety of the test of prosperity is it can so often kind of just, just point us in a different direction. You see, the question we're not going to deal with this morning is, is how do we become prosperous or, or how have we received success? I'm going to go on the baseline that, that we have done it in an honorable way and, and, and a God-pleasing way. But what happens when success comes into our life? What does it do to us? How does it affect our relationship with others? How does it affect our relationship with God? You see, if you read through the Old Testament, you see there is a lot of time and space given to the issue of idols. And sometimes we can read through the Bible and think, you know, that, that's so ancient, it's, it's primitive, and we understand the idea that, 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 that in these ancient c- cultures that, that they would uh, build these idols out of wood or stone or, or precious metals, and they would represent typically local gods, right? Because pagan worship was oftentimes re- revealed around local gods. And, 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 and they would worship these gods and they would sacrifice to these gods and they would honestly believe that how they lived life was determined by what was happening with these idols. And we can look at this and think, gosh, we don't struggle with that. We, 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 we don't have these types of gods and false idols. But if you start to look closely, you realize the idols and gods have not gone away. They have just changed their names and appearance to fit the according culture, the appropriate culture. And suddenly we begin to say, well, wait a second here. Because ultimately what idols demanded from people was their allegiance, was their worship. That people's sense of security and significance was found in them. And for me, that begins to twig something. When I begin to look at the successful things of life, the things that I am good at or the things that I am pursuing, are they the ones that bring more significance and security than God? And I find myself landing again at that place of saying, well, wait a second. Is this an issue? Is this this a test? that God is bringing before me. We read these words 
in the book of Proverbs that talks about how the purity of silver and gold is tested by putting them in the fire, but the purity of human hearts is, by, is tested by giving them a little fame. You know, one of the symptoms of danger that perhaps we are not doing as well in the issue of prosperity is when we begin to see pride starting to creep in. When we begin to see, see things that, that, that we have done well in and start to realize that, yeah, this is, this is all about me. This is, these are the things that, that I have accomplished in my life. And that's why so often we see throughout the scriptures just the importance of gratitude and humility. Those things that prevent prosperity from taking over. And so the question I find myself coming back to in the midst of success is, is what is it doing to me? How is it impacting my relationship with others and my relationship with God? But there's a second test. The test that is not subtle at all. And this is the one that it's like you've been hit over the back of the head with a hammer. And that's adversity. The hardships that we face in life, the, the kind of broad strokes that we experience. You know, it could be broken relationships. It could be sickness. It could be financial difficulty. It could be a loss of a loved one. It could be finding yourself in a situation that you have no understanding as to why you're there, how you got there. It's the questions that you start to, to roll over in your mind and begin to wonder, okay, what, what is going on in the midst of this? It's those places in life that, that it feels as if your prayers are never actually leaving the room. It feels as if that, that, that God is, is, is pulling himself further and further away from you. And it's so often in times of adversity, in, in the difficult places of life, that really begin to place us again in, a, in an opportunity of saying, wait a second, how important is God to me? When I find myself in the places that I need to hold so dear to him. Proverbs 24.10 says, if you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength. I think oftentimes that can also be interpreted how, how, how small is our faith. This, this failure to grasp, again, the depth of God's love. You see, so often, if we believe the false truth that, that when things are not going well, it must be because God is displeased with us or, or God has failed to, to intervene on behalf of us, it begins to paint the wrong picture of God in the midst of life. For me, I found that one of the symptoms of danger, of adversity, is a symptom of bitterness. When I find that I am facing difficult things in life, if I become more and more bitter, it means that something is going on in the midst of my life. Something that I need to get right with God. Now, it doesn't mean that adversity does not bring sorrow, does not bring grief, does not bring disappointment. There's an equally false view that says, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know, if, if, if you have Jesus in your life, that when difficulty comes, then you should just put on that smile, you should just be happy, and you should be glad. And it's like, no, that's not simply the case. We understand that there is grief. We understand that there is loss. We understand that there is disappointment in the midst of life. It's a natural process of sorrow, but it doesn't lead us to despair because despair is when that ultimate hope has been taken from us. You see, bitterness is an issue because bitterness is a feeling of, I don't deserve this. God, you Owe me. And then suddenly we start going down a very dangerous path. My three years that, that, that Rebecca and I spent in Malawi, we, we lived with people who saw adversity that I can never fully appreciate 
in terms of what they go through day by day. Issues of poverty, lack of clean water, wondering where food would come from, issues of sickness, issues of death. But when I thought about it, I realized that yes, there was a sense of sorrow. Yes, there was a sense of grief, but rarely, if ever, did I notice this sense of bitterness. But rather this profound hope that was based upon the reality that even though they didn't understand what was going on, they continued to trust that God was at work. And that's oftentimes where the rubber meets the road. But, but at times in our own lives, we, we try to come to a place where we try to explain it. We try to come to a place of, of, of understanding it more and more. You know, one of the questions that I have found that is not necessarily always helpful when faced with adversity is asking the question, why? Why has this happened? What have I done? Why, why God, why is this going on in my life? And I realize it's unhelpful for a couple of reasons. One is because that question is asked of God at times in the Bible, and guess what? God rarely, if ever, answers that question. People come to God and say, why has this happened? Why have you allowed this to happen? And And there's a sense of silence. The second thing that I've found is oftentimes when we try to answer the why question, we make wrong assumptions about God. The book of Job is found in the Old Testament, right around, right before the book of Psalms. And if you're not familiar with it, here's a real brief synopsis of it. Essentially, Job has everything going for him in life. He is rich. He, he has lots of stuff. His family is healthy. His, his, his health is well. And then, in a moment, unknown to Job as to why, it all is taken away from him. He loses his family He loses his riches. He loses his health. And we're we're given a glimpse of of Job is sitting on this pile of rubble, this ash heap, and he's scraping off this, basically this rash on his skin. He's he's not in a good place. He's lost everything. And, And his wife comes up to Job and says, Job, you know what? You should just curse God and die. Walk away. And and we want to heap it all on Job's wife, but, but we can't because in their culture, they actually held to the belief that what happened to you was an indicator of God's favor towards you. So, so Job's wife was just simply saying, listen, clearly you have lost everything. We have lost everything. And so God has abandoned you. So there's no point in, in chasing after God. You might as well just die and, 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 and call it. Job's like, I don't think I want to do that yet. And then some friends show up. And these friends show up. And have you ever found yourself in a situation where, you know, someone is going through incredible adversity and you don't know what to say? Have you ever been there? I I walk into situations like that, it seems like, all the time. And I've realized when I don't know what to say, don't say anything. Just simply be with them because that's often all that they need. And that's amazing. We we see pastoral care 101 from Job's friends. They show up, and for seven days, they say nothing. They just hang out with Job, and we're told that they came to comfort and to offer sympathy. And just being present with him was enough. But then for some reason, after a week had gone by, they probably thought, you know... We probably should say something. We, we should say something to, 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 to maybe encourage him, to maybe help him, to maybe to get him out of this funk that he's in. And you know the direction they went? Job, clearly you've done something to annoy God with this. There, there must be some sin in your life. And you're like, okay, when I get out of this adversity, I need to find some new friends because these guys are terrible at this. And they try to explain a way why this would happen as opposed to just letting that tension sit. And you know what? I wish I had a better answer for you here this morning as to why bad things happen to good people, as to why adversity comes into our life, but I don't. 
It's just the reality of the world in which we live in. And it's coming to a place of accepting and loving the God that we have. You see, sometimes in our culture, we are like Job's friends in a way that we try to explain the why. We, we try to say things that, that bring comfort to people's life, but if we actually sat down and thought about it, we realized the, these are not the words that we need to be saying. Let me just give you a few examples of, of, of things that I have heard and things that I have read, particularly around that of death. Because death is one of the realities of life that make people incredibly uncomfortable, especially when it's death around someone who is young, some, a death around something that has been unexpected. We say things like, well, God only takes the best. And I think, what, what are we saying, first of all, about God, and what are we saying about everyone else that is still here? Or the other line, when people say, you know what? God needed them more than we did. And I think that's just, that's just wrong. That's just, that's just bad theology. That's just unhelpful. And I know we want to answer that why question so much. But sometimes this is the troubling reality. I love the story in John 6. I was reading through it this morning. And it's a time early in Jesus' ministry when up until this point, everything had been going really well. Like Jesus had turned water into wine. He was like the wedding hero. He healed a, a, a guy's child without even going to visit. And then he takes a little boy's lunch, like some fish and some pieces of bread, and, fee and feeds like thousands and thousands of people, right? Things, things are going well. You know, things are really going well. I, I like that Messiah. I, I want to follow him. And then Jesus starts to talk about the reality of what it looks like to believe in him and what it means to be a follower of him. And, and at the very end of chapter 6, his disciples, not, not the 12, but other followers of him say, Jesus, woof, can you tone this down a little bit? This is troubling. This is hard for us to hear. And we're told that many left Jesus on that day. And Jesus turns to his 12 and says, so what's the deal? Do you want to leave as well? And Peter responds. P Peter always responds. If you read through the Gospels, he's always the one to speak and he often gets it wrong but he gets it right on this occasion. He says, but Lord, to whom shall we go? You are the one who has the words of eternal life. And what I love about Peter is his response of saying, you know what? <laughs> and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I think in Peter's response, it's like, we find this hard. We find this troubling. We don't get it. But where else are we going to go? You are the one who truly offers hope in the midst of difficult times. And so as I think of my own life, as I think of the tension of difficulties and adversity, the, the tension of not being able to answer the why. I wish there was a better solution. I wish I had more answers to give. But in many ways, when I find myself going through difficult places, I, I feel as if I'm in the place where Peter was so many years ago. Of saying, I don't understand. I wish it was different. But Jesus, where else am I going to go? To whom else am I going to return? As I think back to my days as a student, and if I could redo certain things, 
If I want to do better on pop quizzes, on surprise tests, I'd realize that the best way to do better is to be intentional daily in terms of what I was learning and how I was putting it into practice. And I realize I can do that right now in my relationship with God. When God says, acknowledge me in all things and I will make your paths straight. Trust in me. Don't lean on your own understanding. It's a sense of God urging us to say, listen, live day by day with me so that when you come across those, those bumps in life, either success or adversity, you will continue to hold on to me because you will know that my favor and my love for you is not dependent upon the circumstances that you face, but the reality of a life lived. That's why so often, in good or in bad times, people turn back to God or turn away from Him. But when life is just going steady, kind of ambivalent. And God says it's in the ordinary moments that you will see the extraordinary take place. So that when you find yourself in places of prosperity or in the challenges of adversity, you will continue to hold on to me. Because you'll know the reality that I am with you always. I am with you always. And so I don't have any simple solution for you here this morning except to continue to focus upon what Jesus has asked us to do, is to live day by day with him so that no matter what happens in life, we will continue to serve and acknowledge him. Please stand as we sing together.